Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Hey, yeah, it's welcome to the uh, Small Crypto Podcast brought to you by 3Commerce. Pleasure to be here. So tell us a bit about your background and how you got into crypto. Sure. So um, I'm... Um... Uh, I was a long-time gamer, you could say. I Actually, my first job was with Atari in the 80s, uh, so uh, sort of showing my age a little bit, uh, and basically playing with video games, um, making video game-related products uh, for decades now. And um, my first start with uh, really sort of the NFT gaming space was with CryptoKitties. And uh, what actually happened was is that we were acquiring a studio which happened to share an office with Axiom Zen. Uh, the precursor of what became Dapper Labs. Uh, and its founder also became one of the co-founders of CryptoKitties. And it just happened right around that same time uh, when, when, uh, when he was originally, Mick was supposed to join us completely. And then he ended up joining us in an advisory capacity instead because he went on to become one of the co-founders of CryptoKitties. And that gave us a front row view as to what was going on there. Got us really excited about it. And also made us become a very early shareholder uh, in what ultimately became Dapper Labs. And we also became the publishers for CryptoKitties and have been working very closely with the team, uh, including with what they're doing with the Flow Protocol. Uh, I think the part that got us super excited about this uh, is that for the first time through blockchain, gamers can actually own their assets. Uh, and having been in the game industry now for several decades, one of the biggest challenges that I felt, having now been through so many years with gaming-related assets, is that now, we always buy game items and assets and have memories and attachments to them that we think of as valuable, but actually we can't keep them really. It's a memory, but we can't have that. But in the real world, you can ha have those memories, you know, like the you know, maybe early books of your children, family heirlooms, you know, um, victories you've achieved um, with, with, you know, like uh, your tennis rackets or whatever items you have. Uh, in gaming, you can have that. Uh, and I've been through countless gaming experiences where everything I built was lost. And over the decades, that has become an acceptable narrative. You play, you have fun, and you lose everything, and you start all over again. But why is that right? right? And, and so that, that's, that's sort of uh, what brought us really excited about this space. Um, and, uh, and we've been sort of flooding forward towards this path ever since. So yeah, I think you're really one of the pioneers in the whole NFT space, and Animoca Brands has really built a footprint in the whole ecosystem. Um, so beyond uh, CryptoKitties, would you like to talk about some of those assets? Oh, sure. I mean, I think probably our most prominent um, uh, crypto blockchain gaming asset is the Sandbox. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Sandbox is uh, really a great example of, of, of crypto and true digital ownership. Because in this environment, it's kind of like Minecraft or Roblox, but it's on-chain, it's on the blockchain, where any user who makes assets uh, actually makes them as permanent assets and can sell them. We can also, I mean, one of the popular items is land. Uh, in fact, you know, um, uh, block, sort of uh, crypto land is perhaps one of the, has been one of the perhaps best investments recently when it comes to the NFT space. And... Uh, these concepts allow players to have ownership in the assets they build and can also be used by other game companies as well. Uh, and what Sandbox has managed to do is bring all these third-party IP and brands and developers to develop the land of the Sandbox, as it were. Uh, but of course, we have our own um, sort of uh, racing-related one with Formula One and MotoGP uh, called uh, Rev. Uh, and then we have several other projects that we also invested in. Right? We were early investors in Axie Infinity, we were also early investors in Decentraland. Um, you know, we've been sort of uh, also investors in OpenSea, right? So we invested in this entire NFT ecosystem, partially because we, of course, have a strong conviction and belief in it. But also, I think we saw an opportunity to maybe help shape a more open uh, ecosystem. I see the space of digital ownership similar to the promise that the Internet was promising, uh, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, and, you know, it was all the sort of, crazy idealists and dreamers that were sort of thinking about a brighter future. And for the first five to 10 years, that actually was developing that way until it, all the centralized systems came into place and monopolies started to come about and, and change everything. So I think here was an opportunity for us to try to help shape that through not just building our own product, but also investing and continuing to invest in companies that can help grow the ecosystem. Yeah. So I'll just play the devil's advocate for a minute. Sure. But I used to work for an exchange, 
and exchanges are driven by volume. Mm. And NFTs have very low volumes. And I think historically, NFTs have been collectibles which have been driven by fashions. And we saw CryptoKitties do very well and then do a lot less well. And that's been the bias I've held for the past couple of years uh, until I met you and you really helped me realize that things have really changed and that over the past couple of months, we've seen some radical changes in the NFT industry, which could really bring it to a new level. Mm. Uh, maybe do you want to share some of those uh, changes and how you think that yeah. NFTs are going to grow? Well, so first, when we talk about generally sort of assets, you know, the way I look at it is you can look at NFTs like real world assets. They just happen to be on a sort of meta level, on a virtual level, but they are now really permanent, right? And so one of our models is, is that to deliver property rights to gamers or property rights to the digital world, it's a way to ensure that what you now have digitally, you really have, right? Kind of like just crypto or altcoins. You know, whether they're worth a lot or not is one thing, but you can at least define real ownership, right? right? And so I think that's the key first element, which is now which now can be established. Once you have ownership, then what can you do? Well, you can trade them, you can bring value to them, you can do all that kind of stuff. And we see this already today. I mean, are more people trading stocks or are more people trading physical items like stamps or shoes? I mean, you know, anyone who's into secondhand sneakers, anyone here, right? Or, yeah. or, or, or um, sort of uh, coins, like, like literally collectible coins, baseball cards. I mean, you know, the very first start that made eBay big uh, was Beanie Babies. Mm. And for those of the, who remember Beanie Babies uh, in the 90s was this phenomena, Crypto Kitty like uh, where people were trading. And eBay found an opportunity to match the Beanie Baby collectors around the world. And during its initial IPO, uh, the market cap of eBay was probably entirely defined by the success or the downfall of, of Beanie Babies. But of course, since then, eBay and Amazon or Alibaba or all these major trading platforms have emerged as real trading platforms for these kind of goods. Mm -hmm. So it's already happening today in the real world. And what we see and all saw as an opportunity was, well, there's today 2.6 billion gamers. And, you know, and all of them have digital assets of some sort. right? Uh, and when they buy these assets, they think of them as an asset that they own, but actually they can't do anything with it at the moment. Uh, and the most recent BMP Paribas Atelier report said that $100 billion worth of these digital goods were um, sort of sold last year. That was what they said. Now, imagine if you took that $100 billion of value that's there, locked in sort of, you know, basically closed ecosystems, and actually made them real ownership and spread that out, and people could trade them and use them in other games and, or just simply sort of collected them. Uh, we think that's going to create a real explosion. We also think it's a new opportunity for people to make money, right? And I think in this kind of world, you need new kind of ways, especially in the COVID environment where you can't be in a physical place anymore. You can't do the things that you thought you could do. Uh, you need to have new ways of making money. And the virtual world happens to be one which to us is very unbanked because you have all these people playing games, uh, spending time. So actually there's value, right? You're committing something, you're putting effort. But what do you take out? Nothing. Right? Yeah. And this is where I think NFTs really have, have this great potential. And you know, in terms of trading volumes, sure, I, I can see that trading volumes are not going to, it's not high volume trading like what we have, for instance, in Binance uh, or, or something like that. But I also don't think that's the point, right? Because the difference is that the value of each of these assets can also increase tremendously, as we have seen with some of our cars or even with land. Right. Some of these cars sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Um, for, for a lot of money. Uh, and we've seen this in this environment where people, if they desire something, like artwork, like you know, we look at Sotheby's or Christie's auctions, uh, they can go for millions of dollars. Why is a Picasso worth millions of dollars, for instance, right? Um, it's not worth millions of dollars because the whole world wants a piece of Picasso. It's worth millions of dollars because a select group of people really covered it for whatever historic reason. Uh, in a smaller microenvironment, you know, in a, for instance, like family heirlooms, a wedding ring is not that valuable based on the silver that it was made. But if it has gone through many generations for that family and the members of that family, it's invaluable. It's, 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 it's something that you can't even measure in terms of value. Um, and that's basically what we see in you know, what all the stuff that's hanging out of museums, right? 
again, that value comes from that. And that's where NFTs can really play a part. I think of myself as someone who, if I could take all my game assets I played with in the 80s and hand them down to my kids to play in other games, that'd be pretty cool. And why not? Uh, but and now it's finally possible. Yeah. Um, I do agree that NFTs, as they, as they gain more historical value, are going to be worth more. Just like my stamp collection from when I was a kid, there's yeah. all kinds of stamps from countries that don't even exist anymore. Yeah, absolutely. From yeah. Uh, Yugoslavia, from countries that were pre-independence, um, and now they have historical value specifically for that reason. Correct, um, yeah. And uh, the, I guess in, in the case of uh, racing items, for example, the, mm. the cars that win certain uh, big races, for yeah. example, might have some more historical value attached to them. Correct, yeah. And also autographs, right? If you think of autographs, it's a fascinating, not just yeah. movie autographs, you know, famous drivers, racers, artists, right? Um, it's really, really, on the face of it, a scribble on a piece of paper, right? Mm -hmm. But the emotional attachment that people have to it, the value that it gives to them, the joy that it gives to them, right? I think this is the other thing. You know, when we think about exchanges in a traditional sort of way, we really think of it more in terms of real direct value. Like it's an actual functional value. Oh, this share price or this token has this price. I hope it might be that price. Therefore, I might trade it like as an opportunity. But with NFTs, you may just own it for the sheer pleasure or joy of it. Yeah. which is what we do in the real world as well. And that is, very few people buy shares for the sheer joy of it, right? Maybe those who buy Tesla shares might, I don't know, right? But broadly speaking, um, that's not why people make an investment to buy shares, for instance, or to buy tokens for that matter. So I think that is uh, really one of the defining features of NFTs and collectibles, um, what, which is hard to explain until you think of it that way. Yeah. Uh You've definitely convinced me because I bought, say, an F1 Apex car, which was worth a lot more than my real car. But yes. my real car is about 16 years old. Right, sure. Um, but I, um, I did buy an Apex car. And the really interesting thing about buying this Apex car was that I'm able to derive future revenue from it by staking right. and by participating in races. Yes. Um, so maybe you want to tell us a little bit about yes. F1 Delta Time? So first of all, F1 Delta Time is uh, the official Formula One blockchain game. Uh, and underlying that, we have a uh, sort of token called Rev that essentially supports the entire motorsports industry uh, in terms of digital entertainment um, yeah, for, for you know, not just F1, but we announced MotoGP and other motorsports that are going to come to that ecosystem as well. Uh, and part of the reason we tied it into one token is because we found many similarities around that ecosystem. So I think, you know, one thing that blockchain and tokens have shown us is that it can create value or demonstrate the value of a community, big or small, right? And so maybe it didn't make sense to have a specific Formula One related token, but it certainly made sense to have an industry related token, which is why Rev came about. Now, what we decided to do with, with uh, Formula One and Rev was a little different in that, as you can see today with D, the whole DeFi movement, you know, Uniswap, SushiSwap, and all the drama around it, the big thematic has been around sort of making financial services as it will, um, or DeFi, more fun, mm -hmm. right? It's entertaining, you've got food names, you've got, you know, cute graphics. It's really the gamification of finance. Uh, what we wanted to build was kind of the reverse. What we were looking at is really bringing finance to gaming. Mm -hmm. right? Because gaming is one, we think of it as one of those large untapped markets where you have billions of people playing games, creating work, right? So creating value of some sort but actually not monetizing it. And so what can we do if we start monetizing it? So obviously asset ownership, like NFTs is one step, but then you have to have related product. And so the meta for staking um, the Formula One car, in your case, the Apex car, uh, which is a very valuable car, there are only seven um, in the market today, um, is that really you're renting it back to the company and you're renting it to the company for other players to use. And so you're actually really sort of, a, sort of a, a landowner, right? An owner of the car, and you derive an income from, from the usage of the car, right? That's, that's what this is. Uh, and because there's a limited supply of these cars, if you want that car, you have to pay that price, right? Which is actually, again, a mirror of the real world as well, right? If I used it and I, you know, I pick someone up in a Rolls Royce to take them for you know, like a wedding or a honeymoon or something, you pay a premium for that experience as well, right? So that's really uh, what this is about. But we wrap it in an experience that is understandable also to the crypto community where you receive a token 
that is returned to you for providing the car back. Uh, now, of course, there has this other added element is it means that the cars themselves that are available to sell or to use in our time trial game or in the future with our actual games, those cars are no longer available as well, which in and of itself then also creates scarcity and demand for the underlying assets of the NFTs. So what we see on open marketplaces like OpenSea, for instance, is that pre the staking model, uh, the epic cars or branded cars were averaging around one ETH, maybe a little less than one ETH per car. And now I think you can only buy one for minimum three ETH. Right? Uh, so it's created a higher ecosystem. Of course, when that creates more demand for these cars in an ecosystem, hopefully it has also an impact on Rev because in the future, you can buy and trade these cars with the Rev token as well. So that's all, that's all part of that sort of value cycle that we're hoping to develop. And as more people go into that ecosystem, uh, then obviously there will be more demand for the token and more value for the car, thereby rewarding people who have been early in this journey. Yeah. I think uh, the economics of this game is something I've never really seen elsewhere, right. where you can incentivize rent-seeking right. and get people to own racetracks and actually start getting yields off their NFTs, which is a very interesting idea. I think the other thing that's also really interesting is that, um, technically speaking, staking in and of itself could be considered in some jurisdictions as a security product because it's essentially a yield. Mm -hmm. But when you stake an object that's non-fungible, like a car, it's not. And that was actually some of the specific legal advice we got from one of the big law firms, right? Um, at least for places like in Hong Kong, if you end up um, staking a car for income, for instance, it's okay. But if you stake tokens for more tokens, then it's a bit of a gray zone. Now, that was not something that we initially were thinking of by design. It just ended up being something that we ended up learning in this process because they asked us the question, is this, this or not? And so, you know, the other challenging fact, of course, is, is that I think that if this is something that comes to pass in a more broader way, then many of the projects out there will ultimately be thinking around NFTs as a way to create value, as that sort of intermediary bridge of value, because legally speaking, it might be challenging to do that directly as a token. So you might start seeing more fundraisings happening through NFTs rather than ERC-20s, perhaps? I think fundraising through ERC-20s will probably still continue. But when you think about how do you return value, when you think about things like sort of creating um, sort of, like one of the popular mechanics where people would buy into a token is this assumption that the token can only become more valuable because of scarcity, right? So therefore you have this idea of burning the token, right? As a way of reducing the supply. And that's understandable. But again, that takes on flavors much more of a security. Uh, whereas, again, if you have utility for buying an aspect like an NFT that can then give you a different kind of reward, that's actually a different version of this, but actually no longer has the same sort of uh, aspects of a financial product, right? and therefore is not or should not be classified as a security token. Not just based on the legal advice, but also because its form has effectively changed. Because now it's a unique item, and that unique item has also a value that may vary, right? I mean, your Apex car is more valuable maybe than even another Apex car, mm -hmm. right? Because of the look it has, because of the colors it is. You know, yours is the sort of Chinese version, but maybe, you know, the Japanese car, someone in Japan would like it, right? Or the Monaco edition, maybe someone in Monaco would like it, or maybe someone, someone just likes Monaco as a city, whichever, right? So, so there's flavors around ownership that isn't directly attached to the direct monetary reward. I think um, you've addressed a very interesting point, and um, just like to talk about the the way that the NFT industry is changing, mm. and a lot of people have started thinking about how NFTs are could represent certain financial products such as insurance. Mm. Um, maybe uh, would you like to address that point? Well, I think the whole space on um, sort of uh, DeFi and NFTs as sort of a medium of that is, is, is exciting and interesting because. What you're now able to do with is uh, you can actually package a contract, you know, with an NFT, right? And that NFT becomes a representation of that contract. Kind of no different than buying, you know, a physical sort of uh, contract, uh, which has certain terms and conditions on it. The NFT could be that representation of that with the conditions tied to it, to whether it's a pool, whether it's insurance. Uh, frankly, even even if it's something um, sort of a, a product where you can sort of one, one example that's, that's sort of started to get some legs is where 
people have started fractionalizing, for instance, their NFTs, where people said, you know what, let me take an NFT, like let's say take even your, your, your Apex car, uh, it's worth a lot. So it's maybe not exactly accessible to, to, uh, to everyone. But I'm going to just list my car alone, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to fractionalize it into a thousand pieces, and I'm going to basically sell it to the market and see what happens. Uh, platforms are now emerging that are sort of taking advantage of that. The other thing which I think is really fascinating is loans. Right? People are starting to take these NFTs and are saying, well, look, I see the average trading values. I think there's a value for this car. Uh, I'm prepared to take that car as collateral uh, and give you a loan on that. Right? Um, and, you know, so that's, that's, that's exciting. Right? There's also other things on, around insurance, even, and I think this is going to become more important because you have to basically ensure the validity of the product itself. So like the smart contract, you know, can, 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 can it be compromised and all that kind of stuff. So these products will evolve as well to, like I think in the future when you end up buying an NFT that's valuable, you might buy it with insurance to go with it, right? For certain things that might happen to it, right? Maybe not theft or maybe theft, right? Based on, well, you know, have you followed these steps? You know, if you put it in your appropriate security steps, we'll insure it. If you leave it in a hot wallet, we won't insure it, right? I mean, there's like the usual typical waivers. I completely see the insurance industry also moving to this. You know, if you're spending $100,000 on a car, then you might be willing to pay a lot of money on insurance, just like you do in the real world, where when you have an expensive painting, you buy insurance with it as well, right? But on the conditions that you keep it well. Yeah, it's a very interesting space. I know um, Andre Cronje has uh, commented on uh, using uh, uh, NFTs for, for insurance. Right. Um, Devin, I think even before DeFi was a thing, right. uh, was already going to DeFi conferences and, right. and talk about how NFTs could be used. Yes. I think the opportunity for NFTs is really, I mean, in our view, of course, great. But one of the reasons why I think it's, it has this great opportunity is this narrative we're seeing right now on the NFTs, you know, NFTs have been around since CryptoKitties, really, but, uh, or maybe even before, right? Uh, however, people don't understand it because of the non-fungible nature of it. And also, it's a bit more complicated, right? I mean, it's, uh, like it, it's a, like to me, it's a fascinating intellectual journey as well to sort of understand what true ownership of these assets really means. But if you're basically trading actively and you're thinking more about, you know, your return tomorrow, maybe that's a bit more thinking than you need, right? You're just like, you know what, I'm just going to go and, 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 and make a quick buck. And there's a few ways that seem to work from a playbook standpoint. And, uh, and so you're not going to be bothered around the NFT space. But then when you do understand it, actually you understand that that asset uh, process has, I think, much more deeper value potential than just simply trading tokens. Because yeah. the reality is, is that, especially two or three years ago, much of the token industry was driven purely by speculation and mm -hmm. not by ownership. Yeah. And I don't buy a token to own it. Right? I buy a token to sell it, right? That's a completely different paradigm. Yeah. And now, if I buy an NFT, actually I'm probably buying it to own it, right? So it doesn't just only enhance more of this sort of, let's say, hodl thinking, but it's also really you own it because you want to own it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that's, 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 I think, that's, that's, that's really a sort of a, a very different mind shift. And the other thing here where I think the opportunity is in the world of crypto, never mind even just the broader gaming industry, is that there's only 150,000 people in the world that own an NFT. Now, if you think about that, that's like a micro fraction of course of the world but also a fraction of the crypto world which has 40 or 50 million people that own crypto um, and that industry alone is now a roughly 300 million dollar market cap of these nfts driven by 150,000 nft owners so by introducing concepts like rev right uh, into the crypto community you are actually in our case we were thinking anyway that it sort of provides the understanding of NFTs as an asset class in the vernacular that crypto people best understand, which is the fungible token. Oh, wait, what rev token? And countless people have come in and asked us questions around what's a rev token used for? And then we start talking about NFTs. And, you know, a bunch of them are like, well, that sounds kind of crazy. But a bunch of others go, actually, that's really interesting. Let me learn more about NFTs. And lo and behold, people are buying more cars as well, right? Uh, Sand had the same experience, right? I mean, Sand consistently, Sandbox sells out land every, you know, within 10 minutes, every time they do an auction, the land just sells out quickly. And after the listing on Binance, they've now generated over 117, maybe even 120,000 owners of Sand who would have probably never considered anything related to NFTs before they bought Sand. 
And now they go, actually, it just makes sense. This is kind of cool. Maybe I should buy the land. Maybe I should develop something on it. So that's all part of that. And I think because it's so early, it's a great opportunity. Uh, but also why it's so exciting is because we, I think this is a movement that people are beginning to cotton on and say, actually, NFTs, it's not just CryptoKitties. It's much more than that. We should think, look a bit deeper. And uh, you know, I think there's a lot of room to grow from 150,000 to even just a market share in the crypto world, never mind the broader gaming world, which is 2.6 billion gamers who you know, aren't even thinking about this. Yeah, yeah. So I think Animoca probably has one of the widest footprints in the NFT ecosystem out of any company out there. I think it's probably fair to say at the moment. Um, and how, you know, what are the plans for Animoca over the next two years? Well, I mean, first of all, we have a number of projects already um, in the sort of IP side of things that we're developing. One of the reasons we are choosing to work with Formula One and with MotoGP and many of the IP, uh, IPs that we had also announced uh, in the past, uh, like with, for instance, with Quid, right? We basically, that's like a digital collectible marketplace with brands like you know, Marvel and uh, Game of Thrones and all that kind of stuff, uh, is because we feel uh, that the brand, brand way is the way to bring adoption from the sort of regular crypto user. Blockchain, for the most part, for the regular user, is a great solution looking for a problem to solve, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's for everyone inside the DeFi space and for everyone in the crypto world, it's like the best thing ever. And I agree, it's fascinating, it's amazing, it's going to change the world. But for the regular person, it's, you know, Citibank works just fine, right? PayPal works, WeChat Pay works, you know. Um, why do I need blockchain? And this is why I think on working on that side of things for the gaming side, it really solves a problem that they don't even know exists. However, once they know they have it, it's the equivalent of you know rent versus ownership, right? And for the same amount of money, you would much rather do that. So us working with these brands and game assets that we've acquired is part of that. So we have also done a number of acquisitions and continue to do so of game studios that are not on blockchain, but are sort of doing non-blockchain stuff that we feel make a lot of sense to bring them over to blockchain because with that, we bring audiences. That's what happened with Sandbox. Right? In 2018, when we acquired Pixel, who were the creators of the Sandbox, and when then we spun that out, um, you know, they had the right ideas, they had already customers that were, were playing the original Sandbox game, uh, that was a 2D version, and through that porting process, it became probably maybe one of the biggest uh, sort of blockchain gaming sensations today. And that took some time, but that's part of what we're doing. So we'll continue to do acquisitions, continue to bring IP and brands, but we also are continuing to invest in ecosystems that can help promote the whole broader um, sort of ecosystem play of NFTs, which is why we've invested in, in marketplaces. And we're also chain agnostic in the sense that, of course, we understand the importance of Ethereum and we're supporting that, but we're also with Flow and we're also with Wax, and we're also with a, a series of other companies like Harmony that we're working together with because we think they all need to collaborate and work together. I view chains as something that is almost like a, like a country, right? So those people who wish to have everything on Ethereum, great for them, they have a certain ethos, right? Similar to the ones who might exist on EOS or the ones who might exist on Flow in the future. They have a different ethos. And everyone's working towards cross-chain solutions anyway, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a little bit like the opening of sort of free trade. Eventually that will happen. Uh, and, and then, you know, the ecosystems will succeed based on the benefits and services that they will provide to their particular community in the way that, you know, it, it appeals to that audience. Uh, and we want to be the layer that delivers that sort of delightful experiences and collectible experiences to all of them. Great. Well, thank you for your time, Yat. Thank you so much.